Thanks, America. Who, who's, who knows Rome or who's been to Rome? Or oh, Nice. This is fun to be able to say that. I did grow up in Rome. Sorry, this is a little washed out. You know where Rome is, um, center point of the Erie Canal. And when I was a kid um, growing up in Rome, it was kind of fascinating to watch what happened. Um, this is what Rome used to look like back in its heyday. And during the 70s, it, was, it fell down on some hard times, much like most, uh, most of uh, upstate New York with the loss of manufacturing. And um, somebody came up with the idea of replacing uh, the downtown, part of the downtown, with a revolutionary war fort that used to be there back in the 1700s. And um, so we all know our revolutionary war history and the pivotal battle of Fort Stalix, right? Everyone? Usually everybody says no. Um, so what we got was all of this stuff, when I was a kid, was being torn down, and we got this. Um, if that wasn't good enough, we took the fort happened, and we did an urban renewal project for what was left of downtown. We built a pedestrian mall on what was left of, of Main Street, um, two parking garages, new city hall, and because these two parking garages were too far away from city hall, they went ahead and did a surface lot next to it. And if that wasn't good enough, they built a mall on the other side of the highway of, of Erie Boulevard. And uh, this kind of crazy Le Corbusier meets the Ponte Vecchio, they built this big concrete thing that shot over the highway. There were 280 businesses that were in this area that were given checks to relocate in that mall. Of the 280 businesses that were given checks to relocate either in the Living Bridge or in the mall to have this new retail commerce, 18 of them relocated. The other 260-something moved. These are all families that just left Rome. That's what I grew up with. That's, that's city design. And I thought every, everybody was going through this, right? Um, so that's my hometown, uh, or what's left of it. This is my church, where I went to church. And I used to stare at the ceiling and dream about architecture, which led me to architecture school. And I, I, I entered into the University of Miami. At that time, they were going through this process called new urbanism. And these are two of the founders, Liz Plater Zyberg and Andreas Duani. And for me, that was kind of fascinating. Like, here they are talking about cities. They're talking about growth patterns like this. I had no idea that places grew. I was used to a city that was dying. But what they were concerned about are these, these, these development patterns that we were doing, these communities that we were building that were just clogged with traffic. They were making human environments that were inhumane, in a way. And it was fascinating to me. And during a semester abroad program, oh, sorry. Um, so in a way, we call sprawl like a cartoon. But the reality of it in some places is it's a real cartoon. This is San, San Antonio, um, these places that people were making. You know, they didn't have the history that this town has uh, of a sense of place. So um, I did a semester abroad program in another room. This is Rome, Italy. Um, and this is the uh, Campo dei Fiori, where my apartment was. And I went to school over here, and I ate there. And so how is it that I could be from one Rome that's essentially dead as a doornail, and another Rome has been around for thousands of years? How are these Romes different, and how did they survive? Or how did one die? What are the choices that people make in a city? What is a city? So this is the question I want to leave with you. What is your city, and how does it operate? What are the choices that you're involved in in the place that you make? How can you en engender your economic future and understand what's going on? So, I work with a real estate development company that was started by this guy, Julian Price. Julian started a for-profit real estate development company called Public Interest Projects. It's a misnomer. It's a for-profit company. But what we do is 75% of our money goes into the sticks and bricks. We rehab buildings. Um, and then 25%, we seed businesses. So we think about what a downtown is. You need a, 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 a bookstore. So we made a bookstore happen. Uh, the Laughing Seed Restaurant is the first vegetarian restaurant in Asheville. The banks wouldn't finance it. The banks said there's nobody would eat vegetarian food. Well, we happen to know like a bunch of vegetarians. Julian was one of them. So we financed their restaurant. That's been one of the, one of the anchors to downtown. I think it's been in business 30-something years now. So these are things that we just knew our community. We knew it would work. We got that money back. It was a loan to start the business. And we revolved that into new businesses. We just think about how the cities work. But the whole time we're thinking, um, are we thinking about land like a production, like a farm, like a crop? How does, how does land work? So this is one of our buildings. This is an old J.C. Penney's department store that we converted into retail, second floor office, and then residential above. 
when we did this project, we took it on the chin in the community that people said that we were subsidized to do this project because the city paid for a streetscape project at our front door. So our subsidy, we'll, I'll go ahead and own that right now. We got a garbage can, a bike rack, two, ben two benches, and a street tree. Right? That's our subsidy, about $20,000 dumped in front of our front door. Well, we took this building from $300,000 of value, and it looked like that, and rehabbed it. Now it's worth $11 million. Right? One way that we could look at that is that was a 3,500% tax penalty to do the right thing. Right? This is the old tax value. This is the new tax value. That is an increase of 3,500%. That's, that's the way some people could look at it. The way that we looked at it is our community can now afford 3,500% more stuff. It's a gift to the community. It's a community that we belong in that we're investing in. So we want to see that community rise in value as well. I want to see 3,500% better education, 3,500% better parks. You know, these are community decisions that we were making to show value. But everybody kept on saying, you know, Joe, that's great, that's fine, but that's $11 million. We've got this, this, uh, this Walmart over here that's worth $20 million. How do you put that in perspective? How do we make things apples to apples? Now, this is my house right here. That's my wife, Caroline. These are my two dogs. My dogs think they're lions. They're a little weird. Um, Caroline and I pay $2,000 in taxes. We live on a tenth of an acre. So if you had a one-acre cookie cutter that chopped into my neighborhood, it would grab 10 houses, right? Each house paying $2,000 or $20,000 an acre in taxes. Y'all get that? 10 houses times 2,000. If you take that same one-acre cookie cutter, lift it up in the air, and drop it over to the Walmart, Walmart's paying $270,000 in taxes, but it took 34 acres to get there. So on a per acre basis, it's producing about 6,500 an acre. Did y'all get that? What's our building do? $634,000 an acre. So if you all are running the city, what kind of cash flow would you want to have? You know, I can tell you as an architect, I'd rather have that kind of architecture that's here for 100 years. But putting that aside, what kind of cash flow do you want to have for your schools, for your property taxes? What, what are your buildings doing to produce that? So by looking at things on a per acre basis, it's giving us a relative understanding of land consumption. You're probably saying, you know, Joe, that's fine. This is property taxes. There's retail taxes out there. So let's get rid of me and Caroline because we don't sell anything. And let's look at these two that both have retail products. And again, people focus on that $77 million of retail sales, but the reality of that is that the city gets a portion of a portion of that. So there's $0.08 cents sales tax in Asheville. The city's making 27% of that $0.08. Cents. Or, or a total retail of um, $47,500. Or a total, a total tax, so retail plus property tax per acre, of $51,000 an acre. This is just our property tax to the city out of our building per acre. You add the retail taxes, you're cooking with gas. Jobs per acre, 74 versus 6. And you just let the numbers speak for themselves. We actually get residential per acre that they don't. In most audiences at this point, I usually recommend a book to people. I should start getting residuals. Uh, the book is called Moneyball. Um, I don't know if you all are familiar with it. It's written by Michael Lewis. And he's, it's about how there were these mythical decisions that are being made in baseball without looking at data, without looking at the actual statistics of how baseball was operating. And baseball is a $17 billion industry. And it was operating off of gut instinct, arbitrary decisions, um, observation without any information. And that's all that we ask is that cities do the same thing. Bring the data to the table and let it tell its story. So realize that what I'm doing here isn't scary math. I'm not a CPA. I don't have a finance degree. What I'm doing is breaking down the land component and the productivity. I'm dividing acreage and production against each other. So that's the city side. There's also a county side to this. Every city building is also sitting inside a county, right? So you all are Onondaga County shareholders as much as you're a, a, a Syracuse shareholder. So on a per acre basis, this is undeveloped land producing about $30 an acre in county taxes to the county per acre. This is a county resident producing about $1,200 and the city residents producing $1,700. So I in Asheville produce on average $1,700 an acre in county taxes while my county resident out in the unincorporated area is paying about $1,200. Now 
oftentimes cities will tell you that they don't operate on a residential tax base, they operate on commercial. So here's where the mall is at $8,000 an acre in county taxes per acre versus residential down here at about 1,000. Well, that's fine. Most developers will stop you right there and say, this is what you get. Well, let's, let's compare this against the downtown now. So the mall actually drops down to here. This is 8,000. This is our building at 250,000 an acre in county taxes. And I can guarantee you that all the people that live in this building, none of them have kids that go to school. That is money that goes into the system to pay school taxes at a higher density. So it brings wealth to the community. Do y'all get this? I say y'all a lot. It's a really efficient word. I've gone from you guys to y'all, so it's, it's working. Um, we've done this all across the country, mashing up the data that we're seeing in all of the places. We're seeing the same trend line. For every dollar of county taxes per acre that a county single family resident pays, a city res resident's paying about eight bucks. The Walmart's somewhere around seven bucks. The mall is double the Walmart at 14. And as soon as you get to a two-story building, you jump up to about $77 an acre in county taxes. The three-story building's about 120, and then you're at $400 an acre uh, for a six-story building. It's not, a, it's not a proportional growth. It's an exponential growth. And it's, it's real simple, folks. It's, if you have a story of cash flow and you put another story on top of it, you've got two stories of cash flow on the same piece of property, on the same infrastructure. It's efficient. We've been building these for thousands of years. Damascus is 10,000 years old. You know, there's, there's an efficiency to that. In addition to being able to walk around to different needs, we get revenue efficiency out of it as well. So <clears throat> another way of thinking about efficiency, we do this with cars already because we realize cars are all different. All the parcels in the city, I think your county data set is 270,000 parcels that are mostly different. So when we say miles, uh, when we compare cars, we don't compare them on a miles per tank basis, do we? If we did, we'd all be driving Ford F-150s at 650 miles per tank. Instead, realizing that all the tanks are different, we say, well, what the, the gas. The gas is a finite commodity, not necessarily the car. So it's a miles per gallon. And look at that, the numbers changed. You know, I'm not playing with the numbers. The data is there. We're just using different things to anal analyze it. And we should all be driving BMW Assettas at 70 miles per gallon. Sorry to your Prius owners, but 1955 technology beats 2012 technology. Yeah, do you all get that? A gallon of gas costs four bucks. And we're worried about the efficiency of that. Shouldn't we be worried about $40,000 worth of efficiency with the cost of an acre of land? So just realize that this is your dirt. So, you know, I like this quote from uh, Mayor Bloomberg. If you can't measure it, you can't manage it. So our analysis process is to get in there and get the data and figure out what you can measure. So <clears throat> does it work in Syracuse, though? Um, by the way, I like that this is, this is Rick Patino right here, for those of you that don't recognize him. Um, so if we use technology, we can see data. If we use x-ray technology, we can see hard tissue. We can see skeletons, right? We can see bones. If we change the technology and software, we can actually see soft tissue with an MRI. And you can actually go so far as to see um, three-dimensional resonance imaging of brains and stuff like that. If we're doing this on our body to see what kind of data is going on inside us, can't we do this for cities? So what we do is we do these, this is a value per acre map of your assessed value of your real estate. To make it all relative, it's all per acre. And then we color code that and it is a heat map. So exempt land, like this is the reservation, this is, this is 81 straight through town here, this is 481 looping around. This is uh, Skinny Atlas Lake and the town of Skinny Atlas at the tip here. Um, so this is, this is all exempt. Green is $50,000 an acre of value, and the, the other end of the spectrum is purple at $5 million an acre of value, or 10 times the value of green. So, do you all understand that? As you zoom in on this, um, this is looking at just the city limits. And you can see that the footprint of the hospital and the campus, the, the SU, and then the uh, cemetery and park behind it, and the SU kind of spills down the street here. Um, this is the downtown area in here. Here's the lake. With all, there's a lot of non-taxable land by the lake listed as exempt. And when you get into the downtown, you start to see all the purples. So this is the Armory Square area. Or I, I called it the Armory Ellipse earlier. <laughs> I don't know if you call it an ellipse. But um, anyway, there, there's lots of purples in here. 
And it's hard to see it two-dimensionally, so we actually make a three-dimensional model, and we'll leave this behind for you all, but you can play with it in Google and whatnot. So again, here's 81. We've tilted the whole Earth down a little bit, and this is like flying in a town from the south side. And you can see the spikes popping up over here in Skinny Atlas, and again in the downtown. Downtown actually goes off the map. You can't see it. It's, it peaks out up here, and the hill peaks out next to it. Um, so this is just looking at the city limits. And it's just getting, getting you an idea of understanding your tax efficiency or what's giving you productivity from a, on a per acre basis of taxation. Um, and then this is downtown. Did y'all get that? Um, this is a closer in shot of the model and you can see 881 coming through here, slicing the hill from the downtown. Um, again, the non-taxable lands around it. But you can see the huge value density coming out of the downtown and how quickly it drops off as soon as you leave the, the core of the city. But this is where your potency is. This is where you're getting a lot of revenue in a small amount of space. So turning the whole model sideways, flattening it out, you see a spike over here at Skinny Atlas. You see the downtown um, and the hill separated by 81. This is North Syracuse off in the distance, and then it starts to flatten out as you go out of the city. So <clears throat> those are all, we call this the spiky map. These are all individual parcels that we can extrude. When you get other forms of data, it comes into different piles. And this is a conversation we've been having over the last couple of days. Your retail taxes, um, and actually in the state of North Carolina, it's, it's illegal to collect the retail tax data to understand where it's coming from, which I find kind of fascinating. Um, in New York, y'all can get it, but they only report it at a zip code level. So the boundary expands from the parcel to a collection of parcels as a zip code, right? So these are all the different zip codes. And they, so it makes little plateaus, basically. And it normalizes the real the, the, the information. So this is the property tax coming out of downtown, this little nub right here. And the zip code for downtown is actually follows pretty closely to the central business district boundaries. When you bring in the retail in, it was kind of interesting. Destiny pops up, not nearly as high as downtown, but there's a caveat here. Um, what's interesting about Destiny is the zip code splits at the bridge. And some of the retail tax is collected in this zip code and some of the retail tax is collected in that zip code. So it really kind of impacted the data because the zip code on this side is so much bigger. This is something that we're going to leave behind is Destiny's producing a lot. We just can't tell with the data. Lord and Taylor is actually listed as living in the parking lot across Hiawassee. Um, so it's, it's just something that needs to be worked out. Um, so this is the zip code for downtown. These next two zip codes are Destiny, and then this is everybody else. Um, so Destiny is a producer. It's, it'd be more than stacking this on top of this. There, I'm sure that when we collect the data, they'll pop up even higher. It's just maybe the next thing to do. So that's what you get with total taxes. You can tell where downtown is, right? So there's also jobs per acre. We map that out, and you can see downtown in the hill pop up immediately. Uh, the hills, the hills job density is probably closer to downtown because the zip code actually takes in the cemetery. Not a lot of people work in the cemetery, although there's a lot of people in it. Um, they're just not working. <laughs> um, but on a, on, a, on a land punch basis, this is the county's or the city's total land area. That's the footprint of downtown inside the, the whole city of Syracuse. Yet this is its tax production of property tax compared to the whole property tax production of the city. So a square foot of land has a one to nine punch, basically, or maybe a two to, a two to nine punch. And it, what's crazy is when you look at, downtown's also part of the county, it's paying on the Dauga County taxes, yet it takes up 0.13%. So not even a quarter of a percent of the county's land area, yet it's producing 1% of the property taxes. So that's like a one to 13, actually it's a 10 times ratio of potency. Y'all get that? It's like if having one employee doing 10 times the work of people um, from a tax productivity standpoint. On a retail tax standpoint, downtown starts to shine. So we've gone from a, a 10 ratio to what a, I don't know, I guess it would be a 70 ratio of potency. Um, now the other thing to kind of be aware of is there's taxable property and there's non-taxable property. A park doesn't pay taxes. A church doesn't pay taxes. 
They're inside your fabric, but we make them exempt. Um, so you see, again, the reservation here. This is the whole county, and the county has about 16% of it isn't producing property taxes. You all, the, again, another caveat on that is that you all have pilots where you actually work out negotiated taxes with different entities. But for the most part, they're listed as exempt. Um, when you get into the city, you have 32% exempt. This is pretty big. 32% of your city being non-taxable is, 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 a, is a large number. Um, it's not unlike a lot of college towns. In the case of Chapel Hill, North Carolina, they're about 40% exempt, actually 44% exempt. So that, that college has a huge impact on the tax base of the community. Um, when you get into the downtown aspect, you're, you're at about 48% taxable. But again, like I said earlier with the pilots, this isn't fair because these little blue dots here actually do pay a trickle of taxes. So that increases the taxable barrier. When, you, when people say a pilot, how many, how many folks are, are y'all familiar with pilots? Um, it's not that they're not taxable, they're just paying a negotiated tax. So just running through some, we call this running through the, 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 the icons of your community. Everybody's got a Walmart, so this is your super Walmart. Um, value is about, this is your value per acre of your real estate is about $200,000 an acre for the super Walmart. Um, interestingly, when you go to a regular Walmart, the value actually pops up to about $300,000. And you would, you would think that the super Walmart would be more valuable, but the reality of it, what it is, is consuming more real estate. And the bigger you make the parking lot, the lower the value, basically. It's just an, it's an anomaly in our tax system. That's the way the taxes work. Oh, by the way, somebody's asked me one time, they're like, do you hate Walmart? And, and I was like, no, I'm just showing you that they're taking advantage. It's perfectly legal to do this stuff, but it's your policies. If you want to have a policy that if I take up a lot of your real estate and you give me a low tax rate on that, that's what you get. So just be aware of the policies and how it affects your community. You can change your policies. Um, and, and oftentimes, these, these businesses are very smart at figuring this stuff out. So they can actually help you find better ways to amend your policies um, and have a broader conversation. This is the Great Northern Mall at 300,000 or three times the, um, the Super Walmart. Um, Destiny actually has two ways of looking at it. There's the main body of Destiny at about 600,000. But Destiny also owns the big parking lot that's across the road, which drops its value down to about uh, 400,000 an acre of value. So it's just something to be aware of when you, when you increase the footprint, you're actually decreasing the value. Um, Wegmans uh, at DeWitt is coming in around $500,000 an acre of value. Um, and then at Shopping Town Mall, you're over a million dollars an acre. Not as much retail sales, but you've got a higher value uh, physical structure. Um, the building that we're in right now, the, the, I called it the Nymo building. It's got a different name now. Um, I, I, I just love the Nymo name. But um, it's uh, 2.6 million an acre for this property, or about tw more two and a half times the, the Shopping Town Mall density. Um, this is Lakefront Plot. Lake, Lakefront at uh, 500 Plum is about 6.7 million an acre. And then you get into some of the towers downtown. This is the old State, state Tower building at 7.5 million an acre. Um, and then this is one of the big winners downtown at about 35 million. So there is a lesson about density here. There's a lesson about stacking. Um, but one of the keys in this, this is the, going back to the tax production. You know, yes, it, it is right. If you start stacking stories, you can get some dense value. But it's, sometimes it's just smaller buildings can produce wealth too. Um, this building here, is a four-story building producing $68,000 an acre in county taxes per acre versus the tall one Lincoln Center, which is producing more. But this four-story building is doing a lot better than, let's say, the um, this is Shopping Town Mall right here at $6,000 an acre. So at the left end of the spectrum, we've got uh, residential, this is county single family, city single family, then we've got Super Walmart, Walmart, Destiny, uh, Great Northern, and, and again, to be fair to Destiny, this really should have another spike on top of it that's, prop, that's retail tax, but until we can ferret that out, we're not putting it on here. Actually, all the ones that have retail, that's maybe the next step is to map that. Um, 
So uh, Wegmans, Shopping Town Mall. This is downtown with, without the pilots. And when you add the pilots in, you see it bumps up. So you actually get more tax revenue than without pilots. The Hogan Block, the McCarthy Building. This is a state tower building right here at 42,000 an acre. And then this is the Crow Serving uh, Medical Offices at about $200,000 an acre of county property taxes. Now the city taxes for those that are on the city proportionally follow the same ski slope. So the Armory Project, this is uh, Center Armory here, um, is a pilot. But it's valued at about $2.7 million an acre of value. And that had a spin-off effect that actually rose the value of everything around it. So this block immediately west of it is $3 million an acre. This is $3.9 million an acre up here. This is $4.4 million an acre up here. And this is $4.1. Now remember, Shopping Town Mall is about a million an acre to keep this in perspective. The Super Walmart's 100,000 an acre to keep it in perspective. So this is the potency coming out of that area, just in the property tax value per acre. So basically 23 acres of Armory Square, one here, would equal the 60 acre uh, Shopping Town in tax production. Do you all get this? You guys are really quiet. Um, the, now the other lesson in, in Syracuse is there's a lesson in history. There's a lesson in the historic architecture that you have all around you. This is the white building that was built in 1876. That, has, has anybody ever read the plaque that's on the door here? It says, uh, built in, in memory of Horace and Hamilton and White, or, or, this building re replaces the one in which they engaged in business for many years. It is erected by their, by their children. Their children built another building replacing their parents older buildings in 1876. There's a legacy here. This building's been there for a while. This building's been there for a while. This is, this is, this is 90 years old, producing a value of $7 million an acre. It's still 90 years old and producing revenue wealth. Did y'all get that? And then this is the white building here. This was built in 1874. Here's an old postcard with old cars on it. Here it is in 2013 producing eight million or eight times the tax density of Shopping Town Mall. You know, so these, your, your predecessors have left you a gift in your portfolio that's still producing a high amount of revenue return. So basically eight acres, eight acres of this building would equal the entire 60 acre of that. And the question to ask yourself, there's architects in the audience, you know, it's what kind of architectural legacy are we leaving our community? What's gonna be around for future generations? And does our, do our policies encourage or disincent that kind of development pattern? So <clears throat> just to recap, this is a, my napkin sketch, but um, the amount of data that you have when you're making your decisions increases um, in evidence, increases your ability to make good decisions. You know, our role in all of this is just, just to find data, put it out there, find a way to mash it up, let you all make decisions with this. What other, what other data do you need to come back to the table with? Um, it's all out there. You actually have some really cool data out there. Um, what are we doing on time? We're all right. This is, you have, you, you guys, not a lot of cities did this. You all have this stuff called LIDAR mapping where you shoot these lasers around out of the airplanes when you take pictures from the sky. And it figures out different ways to use the, the real estate's being used. And you can break things down by layer like bare soil, buildings, grass and shrubs. I know this is really kind of wonky. But check this out, there's the bare, bare soil layer. Like your computers actually have this information. Can you tell where there's bare soil? Look at that. You can actually tell the run path from home plate to first base. So if that data's there, I can actually go into the computer and mine it. I can figure out how many square feet you have in baseball diamonds. You know, it's insane, the data that you have. So we went into downtown, we went ahead and turned on, this is tree canopy, grass shrubs and water. You've got water going here. Um, we've got building footprints. We've got surface parking. So we can go in here and say how much of your area of downtown, that your most fertile soil of productivity, how much of your garden is being used for vegetables, right? And about 32% of it is got, has, has buildings on it. So this could help you inform the decision of how do we start minimizing the surface parking lots. Now, mind you, I counted the parking structures as part of the built structure, even though most of them are non-taxable. So that's the surface parking lot layer, just looking at that one x-ray of your community. 
this is the challenge for your community is to fill that in. Uh, we also have the data at the city level too. This might be the next level of analysis. Um, these are your bones, this is a little washed out, these are the streets. This is the, the meat on the skeleton of your community. These are all of your buildings and you can actually see the patterns of how your community grew, these diagonal boulevards. Um, little, there's a little square here which is a square grid of community and you can see the density that's here for the downtown but also how road infrastructure kind of chopped it up. Those are all the parking lots that happened because of that road infrastructure that follows Erie Boulevard to the east, Genesee Street to the west, and then the highway is heading north and east. That's all territory that's essentially paying a low revenue uh, to your community. Just for fun, we went ahead and put Destiny at the same scale of downtown. So these two are the same scale here. There's a dividing line here. And um, this, is, this is a typical walk. Let's say you scored a rock star parking spot right here at the end of the mall, and you walk to the mall and walk out. That's essentially covering a quarter mile radius of, 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 of walk. It's the same walk from Salina and um, Fayette to walk to the highway. So when people say there's no parking in downtown, you can literally park by the highway and walk to uh, Armory Square, and it's the same equivalent distance as walking through the mall. Well, it's a lot of it's, the question is how do you change that mentality? You know, part of it is just being conscious of it and just being aware of these similar distances. And then asking, why is it more pleasant to walk through the mall? No one complains about that walk. And a lot of it is that's the challenge for downtown, having better streetscapes, having better storefronts, not having big blank walls that people get bored by. Um, you know, crossing the street's a challenge. You don't, you don't cross the street on the inside of the mall. So it's just things like that, um, having that conversation. And some, sometimes you won't change the mentality. Yeah. Well, in, in Asheville, in Asheville we have no parking requirements in our downtown. Um, we, you park on the street, pay, you have to pay for it, you have to pay to park in parking decks. Um, and it was a real challenge when we first started doing that and eventually we just started ignoring people um, because it, downtown became successful enough that those people were a minority in the, in the, in the conversation. You, know, you can't make everybody happy. You know, I, wa I, wanna be a, I wanna be six foot tall and have a full head of hair. You know, but should my government pay for it? You know, I don't, you know, there's things that I want, but um, it's whether or not we can afford it is the thing. So the other thing I wanna leave you with is, is a form of um, tax literacy. I want you to question your tax policies and engage that as much as you would engage a uh, zoning code. I love this quote from Mark Twain right here. A person who won't read has no advantage over one who can't read. So who in this audience has read your tax assessor's policies on how your land's assessed? Anyone? We've got one. That's awesome. My kind of guy. Um, there is a this study that we did, this is Cheyenne, Wyoming, and we did an analysis of removing the buildings and just looking at the land and how it's valued on a per acre basis. And what we saw here, and this is blue, so it's about $15,000 an acre. As soon as you cross the street, it jumps up to $35,000 an acre. And I asked the audience, I said, what's going on there? Why is, why is the land double just crossing the street? And the tax assessor was sitting in the front row and she raised her hand and she said, you don't understand. And I said, what don't understand? She goes, well, the more land you have, the lower the value. Think about that. I was like, really? Huh. So if I've got three quarters of a mile of a road here, three quarters of a mile of a road here, another half mile and half mile, I've got three miles of your infrastructure. I've got the biggest site on the street, which means I probably have the most trips. If I have the most trips, I probably have the most car accidents. I'm sure we can collect the data on that, which means I have more police calls. I'm consuming more service. And you're not charging me for it? She's like, no, no. That's our standard. And I asked her, I said, where, where did you get this standard? You know, did, did Moses deliver it to you? I mean, it's, can you not change it? Do you not see that this is hurting yourself? But again, this is a standard that's in, in every community. It's here. This is, let's kind of zoom into the city for a second. You see anomalies in your real estate. This is a block. You see a little pink, pink one here in the middle of red. You're seeing this is all light. This one's dark. So that's a, that's a, a jump of about $500,000 an acre just by crossing a property line. So again, it's just being cognizant of the mechanics and the financial drivers that are buried inside your policies that make me as a developer respond in the marketplace. Did y'all get this? You know, th these aren't invisible forces 
of, of, of the hand of, of the free market telling me what to do. They're, I'm following policies that you have in place. And you all can change them. So this is what's kind of fun. We're like, we always do this when we go into a community. We think about if you were a sports team, how would, what would you be? Um, downtown Syracuse is a taxable value of about $303 million. Who knew that? Anyone? Tax guy? No? Um, that's the equivalent of, you can almost own those two hockey teams. So if you thought about uh, the downtown being the Sabres or something, or if you're Syracuse, it's $3.4 billion. Incidentally, that's the portfolio wealth of Donald Trump. So you guys are Donald Trump. You also could own the Yankees, the Bills, and the Sabres. And I can guarantee you the Steinbrenner family probably knows what they pay to clean towels in the, in the locker room. Do you guys run the math to understand what it costs for a street, what it costs to plow something? What, you know, start doing this stuff. Understand the dynamics because this is, you're all shareholders in this corporation. Your city is chartered in that. And more amazing is your county is really impressive. It's $21 billion of value in, prop, in assessed value, in, in property value, or taxable property value. That's 2.3 times all of these. Every single New York professional sports team you can own twice over. Isn't that crazy? So just to recap and close, <clears throat> cities to me have a DNA. You have a place in time. You're, you're heading somewhere. I have a place in time, right? I have DNA. This is how I started my life when I had hair. This is what I'm going to become, right? I will be Papa, whether I like it or not. Or more importantly, I'll be this guy. And I've got two genetic issues. I'm genetically Italian, so I like to eat a lot. And I have a genetic predisposition to heart disease. Every Minicozy man has had a heart attack. I'm going to have one. So I have to take that into account how I'm growing, right? I have to exercise. If I have, you know, on college game day, I'll eat a lot of chicken wings and pizza. So I have to exercise the next day. I mean, I have to work on this. Syracuse, which, who's your grandparent? What does Syracuse want to be when, it's, when it grows up? What did you learn from your last heart attack? You know, these are all things to, to be concerned about, and that's the lesson I want to leave with you all with this is do the math, understand the data, and figure out what you can do here. So I'm just hoping to nudge that along. Thank you.